Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. It's in Acts 1, verse 12, and I'll read from verse 12 down to the end of the chapter. Acts 1, beginning in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples Altogether, the number of names was about a hundred and twenty, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go down to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. Two weeks ago, we, um, we began this study of the book of Acts, and Um, Again, coming out of the book of Ephesians, we saw how Paul declared that he had um, special knowledge in the the mystery of God. And that mystery we saw was the formation of the church, how um, the Jews and the Gentiles would become as one um, in Christ, and that we would approach God uh, by one uh, sacrifice and one Holy Spirit coming into him. And in that, as well, um, we saw how that Luke shared what went on at the time when Jesus was ascended, when he was taken up. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But that Jesus, at that moment, gave them a command. And the command was not to be witnesses, not yet. The command was to wait. To wait. And we talked about how hard that is for us to wait. But then he told them, it, they were, specifically, they were going to be waiting for the power of God to come upon them. He gives them two promises along with that command. And the two promises were, first, that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about um, in the next week's coming up. We're going to spend four weeks in the book of, or in chapter two. Okay, so we're going to talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the gift of tongues and that kind of stuff. So, so hold on to your horses. That's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Okay? But you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. So you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? And you're going to be witnesses. It's going to be. That's a done deal. This is what's going to happen. But for right now, you have to what? You have to wait. How many days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ was this conversation? How many days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ did this conversation happen? What'd you say? Eh. 
Oh, wait, wait, the teenager gets it. What's it, Kaylee Rain? 40. 40 days. So 40 days after the resurrection was the ascension of Christ. Good job, Kaylee Rain. All right. David, did you teach on that recently? You got that smile like a Cheshire cat, like, yes. Good job, Kaylee Rain. Okay. So 40 days. So my next question, though, Steve, ready for it? Okay. The question, the question was, how many days after, how, when did it occur? How many days after the resurrection? 40 days. So here's your, keep your answer. You ready? What day was it, how many days after the resurrection that was Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them? 50. You're right. That's what I said. Keep your answer because it wasn't going to change. Okay, good. Okay, so if this conversation happens on the 40th day and Pentecost happens on the 50th day, they still have what? 10 days. Good job. I love math. This is a little, little math word problem in math. Wasn't it exciting? And we used the Bible to do it, okay? A real simple, you know, this minus this, and we get this. Okay, so 10 days. But now they have 10 days to what? To wait. Did they know what day the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them? No. See, we got it because we got hindsight. We read the book of Acts. We know this is how it's going to play out. They didn't know that. Think about that. They didn't know. They were just told to what? Wait. So don't allow your reading into the passage. So whether we like it or not, there's a lot of times we eisegetically look at passages. Eisegesis means that you're reading into a passage. Okay? So don't diminish what's happening for them right now. Okay? We know it's 10 days. They don't necessarily know it's going to be 10 days. So put yourself in their shoes right now. You've been pumped, 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 because Jesus came back, right? You saw the resurrection. You knew he was dead. Now he's alive. It's, 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 it's for real. And you're thinking, now's the what? Now's the time. The time for what? We talked about that two weeks ago. The kingdom. He's going to establish the kingdom. And we are his ambassadors. I mean, we're the, we're the, I mean, come on. Other than Judas, we're the what? Sub rulers. Yeah, I mean, we're the eleven. I don't know. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd probably struggle with that a little bit, even though I may be spiritual because I knew Jesus and I was kind of hanging around with him. I'm probably going to struggle just a little bit. Like, this is really kind of cold. The kingdom is going to happen. And I get to be the treasurer because Judas, he was the treasurer and he's gone. So somebody's got to replace him. And so, or I get to be this or I get to be that, right? And Jesus says what? Sorry, it's not going to happen that way. It's not for you to know the times or seasons, but it's for you to what? Wait, (laughs) what? Yeah, wait. Because what's going to happen is the power of God's going to come upon you. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to become witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, in all, in, in all Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the world. Cool stuff. And then he left. Then he left. It's out. Gone. And now what? Now what? What are you going to do? What are you going to do while you're waiting? Because you don't know how long you're going to wait. We are that group of people. You can take 11 of us and make us the, the apostles, and the rest of us just kind of the disciples. We're kind of hanging out, right? And Jesus is here, and he's talking to us. And he says this, what? I want you to wait. And then I'll say, He's gone. And now you have to make a decision. What are we going to do? Uh, earlier, what did they do? I went fishing. <laughs> hey, who wants to go to the lake? <laughs> but Jesus said to do what? I want you to wait in Jerusalem. Does anybody know a story about a person who was supposed to wait in Jerusalem and they couldn't wait? They had to go find a couple servants that, that escaped. Oh, yeah. Who was it? He was a... He was a descendant of Saul's, right, who mocked David. And so David didn't do anything to be told Solomon to take care of him. My mind's blanking because of the G. My mind's blanking at his name. So he tells me he has to stay in Jerusalem. The day that he leaves Jerusalem, he's going to, to die. Well, a couple years later, he decides his servants take off, and so he decides he's going to leave Jerusalem. And he comes back and he, what, dies. Well, I don't want to be that guy. I mean, you know, <laughs> Jesus said what? Hang out, but not just wait. Wait in Jerusalem. So what are you going to do? Twiddle my thumbs. 
Yeah. It's not what they did. They instantly had a prayer meeting. And they prayed. And they sought God's will. And they looked to God. And so I don't want to walk away from the challenge to Bob or to us. We say we want to be a New Testament church. What would we do? What is the focal point of this church? What would be the principal feature of this church? So two weeks ago, Luke tells us the foundation of the church. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today he begins to reveal to us the focus of the church. And we're going to see this throughout the entire book of Acts. That when you see the church gathering, and they gather a lot, prayer is always involved. And as we're going to see in the first point, because the prayer is going to be involved in two aspects coming through this passage. First of all, it's involved in the principal feature of the church, and I call it that because it's the unity. It's the identity of the church is unity because Jesus had declared that in John 17. Overwhelmingly in his prayer for the church, he prayed to the Father that we would be one, that we in our oneness, in our unity, in our oneness, that we would be able to reveal the oneness of the Godhead. Again, last week, John comes, right? We talk about the multiplicity of of the Godhead, you know? And that's one of the things that as we are one, as the body of Christ, we reveal that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So our unity is important. But in the unity, there's also the the adhesiveness, which is prayer. So we read that right off the bat, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. We talked about that last week, about that Sabbath day journey stuff, right? So a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Then he lists the, the, the apostles, right? These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So their unity, they were together in one accord. And when they were together in this one accord, they were brought together through prayer. Prayer is critical to us being unified. When we teach... um, Years ago, I haven't taught a, a parenting class for a while. Think about that maybe for next year. Um, families ought to be in f- toward each other, focused inside. Okay, but too many times families are focused outside to their to their outside activities, and kids are drawn to this and this and this and this and this rather than the the identity of the family who they are as a, as a family. It happens in the church as well. We have a, wind up having a lot of outside activities and a lot of things that draw our attention elsewhere, and we wind up then losing the integrity or the identity of the church. One of the things that brings us together is having something in common. Well, what is the one thing that we have in common? Jesus Christ. And we have the privilege, the unique privilege of coming together before the throne of grace and joining one another. And so Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Now, I I get it. We can turn around and say, well, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. So no matter where I'm at, what? He's there. But Jesus says that there's a special moment when the gathering of believers join together and they pray. And he is then especially present. Can I explain that to you? No. I just know it's true. And again, as we talk about that spiritual war, right, that happens, this is a spiritual warfare thing. This is a spiritual moment. Just as I believe when we have communion, when we take participate in the Last Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, for this reason, some of you are sick and some are even dying, because you are abusing, you're misusing the, the, the body and blood of Christ. Not that we believe that the, the, the crackers become the body and not that we believe that the juice becomes the blood, transubstantiation. We don't believe that. However, there is the reality that this is a special spiritual moment where we're gathering together and God says that in that then there is something spiritual that goes on. These disciples had changed. 
because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was now the foundation of their faith. It was the foundation of their lives. It was the foundation of their acts. It was the foundation of everything they would do from this moment. And the first thing they wanted to do then was join together to go before Jesus Christ, before God at the throne. I think seeking his wisdom, seeking his understanding, seeking his patience and his endurance while they waited. And so they came together and were told they came together then in this composition of prayer, right? Was that they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Sadly, many of us take those as totally equal. Prayer is supplications. Supplications is what? Asking. And that's what we kind of make prayer. Prayer just means I'm what? I'm asking. But this is prayer and supplication. Prayer is communication with God in worship. It's not just asking. But we diminish it to just asking. We give God the laundry list. Give me this, give me that. Bless me, Lord, I pray. Anyways, I can continue the song. It's a kind of fun song. But it was like an eye-opener song. It's called The Laundry List. That's what we do with God. We give him our laundry list. Oh, by the way, while you're in the, in, in the area, God, can you do this for me too? Rather than understanding that prayer is fellowship with God. I have the opportunity every day, throughout the day, to what? Have fellowship with God. That's why Paul says, pray what? Without ceasing. Dude, if I had to be on my knees and close my eyes and bow my hands, I'll never eat. I never go to the bathroom. I never get a shower. You don't want to sit here and be around me if that happens, right? And so there, that's not what he's saying. Prayer is communication with God. It's fellowship with him. It's taking the time to be in his presence. And then, yes, there's supplications. There's what? There's asking. There's seeking his favor. But as I saw from Ephesians chapter 1, I already am a favorite. I am one whom he has bestowed his favor. How cool is that? In, where I'm told in 1 John chapter 5 that when I go before him, if I ask anything according to his will, I know I'm going to get it. Because he's going to hear me. If I ask anything according to his will, he'll hear me. And if he hears me, I'll get what I ask for. That's what it says in 1 John 5. That's name and claim it. But notice what the name and claim it is. I'm asking according to what? His will. I'm not just asking according to Bob's will. That's, that's what's taught as name and claim it. That's error. That's unbiblical. My supplications should be asked according to his will. I only know that if I'm doing what? Spending time in his word. When you spend time in his word, you'll understand what his will is. When you understand what his will is, then you'll understand what you should be asking for. And then you'll start getting answered prayer. You have not because you ask not. But when you ask, you ask what? Amiss. Why? So that you may spend it on your own pleasures. James. So when that's happening, it's because I'm focusing on Bob and not on God. So they came together, right? And they came together with unity in prayer, okay? But I want you to note, just as a real quick, and I don't spend a lot of time on this, who it says with the participants. They all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Just a real small thing, okay? Because, again, we teach 1 Corinthians. We teach the, the, the role of a woman, okay? And so 1 Corinthians 14 is very clear. Let a woman keep silent in the churches, okay? We understand that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that a woman shouldn't usurp authority over a man, nor should she teach a man. Okay, and so there are some bodies of believers where a woman, when she walks in the door, isn't at a church, isn't allowed to what? Speak, <laughs> mum. Put a piece of duct tape over your mouth and don't say a word. But First Corinthians eleven says that a woman should seek to have a covering on her head, okay, because she is the the, the, the glory of man, okay, but to show respect and honor to her head, okay. 
And so, and it's because of the angels that she has it. But having her head covered, she's able then to do what? Anybody know? To prophesy. Okay? She's able to give a testimony to declare what God's word has said. Okay? She's not supposed to be teaching, 1 Timothy 2. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 is all about. Okay? In the, the, the concept of proclaiming God's word and teaching God's word, she's supposed to keep silent in the church. And if she has a question, she's not supposed to question the authorities who are teaching, but rather she's supposed to ask her husband at home. But it doesn't say that she doesn't, can't say anything. The concept of being silent in the church is, has everything to do with authority. They were having corporate prayer together. And the women were participating. They were there. Okay? So I, I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I just want you to see that, that from the beginning, they understood that it wasn't a, just purely men, the women were involved, but each had a what? A role. Okay? And we need to understand that, and we need to, to not back off of the roles from that perspective, R-O-L-E. Okay, I know I spell my, my, my role and a role and that kind of stuff, but it's, so I'm talking about R-O-L-E roles, not the R-U-L-E roles. Anyways, and so, but... But I don't feel like, I feel like people who go the route that we, we, we believe also can become legalistic in that as well. And so there's not that legalism in the Word of God, okay? So that's who it is. But the second part, so they prayed in that principal feature, but really the, the core of this passage has to do with the selection of Judas' successor, okay? And so the first thing we see in this is that there is a need for an apostle, and it's shared, first of all, by Peter. Peter says, he comes up and and I, I'm just going to be, can I be blant, just blatantly honest here, okay? This is a very pragmatic moment, okay, in the church, okay? Because Peter's looking around as part of the prayer. Now, I want to come back and I'm going to couch myself or speak against myself in one moment, okay? But Peter's there, and, and, and they're, they're, they're gathered together, and they're praying together. And Peter has this decision that, at this moment, that, wow, there's only 11 of us. There were supposed to be 12, what are we supposed to do? I think we need to find out a 12th person, and, and we need to get somebody, okay, to, to be able to take his place. And then he declares how it's declared in prophecy, okay? So what do we see? First of all, the first statement, there's two statements that are there. The first one comes from Psalm 69, okay? So there's two passages that are kind of taken and thrown together. And so Peter grabs Psalm 69, verse 25, and he says, let their dwelling place be desolate. No, because it says, it, it, it states this. And I just want you to think to yourself, if you're Peter, what makes you think you, you go to Psalm 69 and grab verse 25 and rip it out of its context, okay? And all of a sudden, this applies to Judas, okay? Now, I know it's going to sound like, what are you talking about? Just hang with me a moment on this one. But I, I want you to understand, I mean, just get the feel for this whole thing. You know, that, like, well, how's this playing out? But if you go to Psalm 69 and you read it, and I have it up here, it says, Hear me, O Yahweh, for your said, your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me out of, because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Does this sound like anybody? Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? I could have made all this purple even on the, in the middle there, but I was trying to kind of accentuate it a little bit. It sounds like Jesus. Well, all of a sudden, now we have this messianic psalm which not necessarily would we have understood to be messianic before but now our attention is drawn to it so now all of a sudden we have wow this is talking about jesus okay so let their table become a snare for them and their well-being a trap let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and make their loins shake continually pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them let their dwelling place be empty let no one live in their tents wow now all of a sudden if this is messianic and this is talking about jesus up here this also is messianic from that perspective are you tracking with me and the people who reject messiah what do they have waiting for them say again hardship judgment Judgment, I mean, so God, I mean, this is Jesus. Jesus is talking, this is Jesus talking. Pour out indignation upon them. 
One day they're going to stand before the judge. Who's the judge? Jesus. Jesus will be the judge. He's your advocate, but he's also the judge of those who rebel against him and choose not to submit. And he will pour out his wrath upon them. That's what they have waiting for them. So Judas, as we talk about in 2 Peter, okay, this is a great illustration. Judas knew who Jesus was. But he made a specific choice to do what? To go against him. Was he saved? Wasn't he saved? We can have the total debate on that one. But clearly, God's word says what? He never was. He was chosen by Jesus, we're told. As the what? Son of perdition. It didn't take Jesus by surprise. Prophecy would be fulfilled. And you can debate whether God caused him as a child, as, you know, created him as, a, as a, a person of wrath. You can look at the Proverbs on that one in Romans chapter 9. Or whether it was a choice on, on Judas's side. And, and, and you can debate all those things theolo- theologically. I don't care. Judas made a choice from my perspective. But it didn't take God by surprise. So Jesus p- picked him particularly, especially because he knew what G- Judas would do. But then we go to Psalm 109. Okay, verse 8, and again in context, to the chief musician, a psalm of Daid, David again. So the other one was a psalm of David as well. Do not keep silent, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened up against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They, note the pronouns here, note the pronouns. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers. Again, messianic talking about jesus but i give myself to prayer what did jesus do in the night in which he was betrayed spend the night in prayer right i give myself to prayer thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love set a wicked man over who him not them note they 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 so second wicked man over them it should be over them but now all of a sudden we have over who Him, singular. Because the evil and the wickedness would be personified in one person. All evil and all wickedness. Where does it boil down to? Satan. When Ephesians chapter 2, we were told that we were children of what? Wrath. And we we followed the course of this world after the prince of the power of the air. The, The fact is it also comes back down to this battle between Lucifer, who said he wanted to be like the Most High God, right? And, and then a third of the angels followed after him. So we have this spiritual war, this spiritual battle that's going on, the, the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places, this battle that's going on, right? So, and I'm not saying that this is Satan here, but when it boils down in, into, the, into what we're talking about right now, who filled Judas? Satan, you get it? Okay. So set a wicked man over him and let him be an accuser's let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayer become sin. Ooh, that's kind of rough, isn't it? Let his days be few and let another take his office. There's a time when it's too late to pray. There's a point when it's too late to pray. Let his prayer become sin. The prayer of a wicked man is an abomination before God. That's kind of rough. That's from, from the book of Proverbs. But that's, that's harsh sounding, isn't it? But God knows your what? He knows your heart. He knows your heart. He knows where your prayer is coming from. And if you are praying out of a selfish heart, a self-centered heart... The reality is, you're, it's the same sin as Lucifer. You want to be like the Most High God. You want God to do what your will is rather than you doing what God's will is. That's a stinking heart. And so in this application, Peter now kind of grabs these two verses and slams them together. 
And at first, when you read it, you've got to ask yourself, what's Peter doing? But then I go to the, the 2 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy. Watch. Anyway, you're going to know the verse, right? All what? All Scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration to God. It's that anustos. It is breathed by God. You have to ask yourself, do you really believe that or not? So when Peter was speaking at this moment, when was he being controlled by the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter chapter 1, or was he doing this on his own? You have to make a decision. I see your head, Jose. But still, the reality is that people have to what? You have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Because this is exactly when Peter writes and he uses Scripture in his epistles, when Paul uses Scripture in his epistles, and sometimes you can ask yourself, well, how did, where did that come from? Right? Were they being led by the Holy Spirit or not? God's Word declares they were. Jesus said that Peter would be the foundation, he'd be the rock of his church. Was he guiding him? Was he directing him? This is a hard battle for Bob. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment, okay? So in this, then, so I don't think Peter's just flippantly kind of throwing something out. What were they doing? What is the context of Peter coming up with this idea? Don't, don't, don't forget too far back. We were only talking about this about 10, 15 minutes ago. What were they doing? Praying. They were waiting, but they're praying. While they're waiting, they are praying in the midst of the praying. So do you believe that God will guide his church through prayer? Amen. We say amen, but then we, how do we act, though? And so will God give us guidance? Will he, in a sense, put it in the idea, if you would, the, the elders were meeting, we're talking about a new building. And so there sometimes frustration on Bob, and I'm being straight out, okay? Where it's like, man, I want to just I want to put it down and I want to get there, but we still talk. And then come, someone comes up with an idea. You know? I mean I could go to the meeting we had on, on Friday and I could point to Steve where there was a time when Steve made a comment. I went, Wow, Steve, that's really good. I'd never thought about it that way. And all of a sudden it begins to change a little bit what you're thinking. Make sense? Or David or Chuck might say something and go, huh, hmm. And now all of a sudden we're meeting again next Friday. <laughs> but what are we doing in the meantime? Hopefully. Praying. And we're going to be asking you guys to what? Pray. Because we want God's will. But God works in the midst of that. While you are praying and while you are meeting with him, while you're fellowshipping with him, with him, with him, he speaks back to you. Because it's communication. It's two-way. Or do you only see prayer as one way? I tell God. He listens. But it's two-way. So God, I think, puts upon Peter's heart a need for an apostle. So now we get into this decision-making process. How are they going to do it? Well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to look for qualified candidates. So Peter puts out what he believes ought to be the qualifications. He says, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, so all these people who've been with us, for what extent? The entire ministry, right? So the first qualification is they were eyewitness testimony of the earthly life in ministry of Christ. I think that they ought to be with us, Peter, right? All the way from the time that he was being baptized of John to the day when he was taken up from us. So we want guys who've been hanging out with us from the time that Jesus was baptized all the way to the time that he was ascended. So they are going to be eyewitnesses of his earthly life and his ministry, and they're going to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection and ascension of Christ. These guys are it. Well, this is attested to by Paul. So Paul wasn't one of these. What was he doing at the time? Not yet. Yeah, he wasn't persecuting him just yet. He's kind of still sitting under the feet of Gamaliel right now, okay? The church hasn't exploded yet. He hasn't started persecuting him yet. But he's not a believer. Make sense? He's not in that upper room, is he? But later on, we see in Acts 13 that Paul affirms what these qualifications of an apostle would be. 
And then we see in 1 John 1, 1 to 3, that John himself affirms it when he begins off as apostle with that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. When he talks then about that as well, the fact is that he's a witness of seeing Jesus for who he is. Okay? So, so Peter says, these are the qualifications. So they look out amongst them, right? We have 120 people in this upper room, right? And they then choose two. They choose Barsabbas and Matthias. Literally, it says, they stand two up before them, okay? And so now, the question you have to ask yourself is, were there only two? Of that, were there only two? Were only two others who, who did that? Or... Of the many, did they choose to? Before Jesus is going to send out this 11, so before they choose Matthias, right? Is he's going to send out these 11. Were there a time when he sent out disciples? And if so, how many did he send out? Does anybody remember? 70. 70. Okay. It might be 72, but I think it was 70. 70. Okay, and when he sent out the 70, okay, what were they able to do? What were they able to do? Don't be mum. What were they doing? They healed the sick. They cast out demons, right? And he told them, when you go out, don't take any money bag with you, right? But wait for me to provide for you, in a sense, right? Okay, shake off the dust of your feet if, if, if you go there, okay? So, so potentially... Unless some of these 72 have died in the last couple of years, or they have turned away from the faith, which is kind of an amazing thought process, okay? There's more than just what? Two that they could choose from. So, so in my brain, I'm trying to process this. Did, how did they do this? Because we're not told how they did this. They stood two up before them. Was it because amongst themselves they couldn't agree on one? Did they narrow it down to two? How is this process? Because there's going to be a two-step process now of how they're going to choose. See, first they get it down to two. Because they could have been clearly up to at least 70, right? Or even more. Because it didn't say, and they had to be part of the 70 who had received all this. We don't know whether Barsabbas or Matthias are any of those. They could have been outside of those guys. We don't know. Okay? So, what are they going to do? Well, they sought God's will. The first thing they did was they had a time of prayer. They're already praying, but now they're going to pray specifically. In the midst of the prayer, God has given Peter an idea, a thought. He's disgusted with everybody. Everybody has agreed to this, right? And they've come along to, to say, well, there's two. The, the, we, we can agree on these two. I don't know why there was no agreement on the other ones, but there was agreement on two. Or maybe there was indecision regarding two. In other words, we can't have an agreement. We got 11 of us trying to talk about this, and five are for Sabbath, and six are for Matthias. Or going the other way. There was no unanimity, potentially. But what they want was what? They want unanimity. They want unity. Are you tracking with me? Okay. Again, that's who they are. They want to do everything of what? One of cord. So they pray, they pray, and they seek God. And in their prayers, they reveal two specific things that they believe about God. First of all, that God is omniscient. He knows the hearts of everyone. You who know the hearts of all, show us which of these two you have chosen. That God is not just omniscient, but he's also what? He's sovereign. We don't want the one that we want in the end. We want the one that you have already chosen. Isn't that something to think about? I'm excited with Steve and David and Chuck being elders here. But in God's economy, they were already elders here long before I knew them. Does that make sense? Isn't that kind of neat to think about? And so they took this time of prayer calling out to God, claiming who he is, who he has been, and then asking him for specific requests. And that specific request was, show us 
which one. And now is the part where I, if you haven't been paying attention in that Bible reading, if you haven't been paying attention every time you read this, you're going to knock your socks off. Because it wasn't just a prayer. Because at this point, it ends for us, doesn't it? But what do they do next? They have a toss of faith. They have a toss of faith. Because we're told now at this point, when they come to this part, that they proposed to, verse 23, Joseph called for Sabbath, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. They cast their lots. They didn't cast votes. They cast lots. The lot was little stones, little rocks, that you would roll out. You would cry out to God, God make known. So in your brain, I'm not telling you it's dice, but think dice for a moment. God, do you want me to take this job? Evens, yes. Odds, no. God, you are all-knowing. You know the beginning from the end. You know what will happen if I take this job and what will happen if I don't take this job. God, you are sovereign even over this paradise. And so, God, I ask you at this very moment as I roll these dice to make, will, to make your will known. Maybe it's one die because it's only one stone, a lot instead of lots. And you cast it out there. And it comes out even. And you say, no, I don't think it's right. Ah, I don't want that job anyway. Doesn't work that way. Best two out of three. That's exact. That's how we operate. That's not a toss of faith. That's a toss of control. Well, maybe God just didn't get the dice right. He that really doesn't know what I want. No, he doesn't really care what you want. Say <laughs> Gideon double check. That's exactly what Gideon did double check. Okay, and so God can do that. Okay, I, I get one hundred percent. I totally agree with you. Okay, don't have a problem with that. Okay, I can go that route with you. Not a problem. So, but the point is, we have a struggle as a whole of even doing what? Rolling the dice. Even thinking that way. How do we choose, in most churches, how do you choose a deacon? Now, we don't really do this here. Say again? The requirements. But then we bring together multiple people. Right? And then you have a popularity contest. A secret, secret vote, but everybody votes. And you count them up, and it's a popularity contest. And whoever gets the most votes wins. What if you said it has to be a unanimous vote? When's the last time you saw a church say, we're not moving forward until we, until we have a unanimous vote? You might not ever have any deal. Now, isn't that Because is God divided? God's not divided. Say again. We would here. No, I understand that. But so again, I don't want to set up the straw man, but there's reasons why we do the things that we do. That's because there's only a handful of people here. That's right. It's only because there's a handful of people. It only takes two to have conflict. It only takes two to have conflict. So we're going to talk about that, okay? So, so here's, here's the deal, okay? So, so in that... If your goal is unanimity, okay, then you're seeking ways to seek unity. God has placed in his word ways to, to get around division. Now, the, the reality is that the sinful heart of man is the sinful heart of man. And no matter what you do, there is going to be times when what? People are, are not going to like whatever happened, and they're going to they're walk away, right? That's the sinful heart of man. There's nothing I can do about that, Okay. But God puts out this concept of casting in the lot, okay? And it's all through it is word, okay? But casting the lots, first of all, to seek a divine decision from God, okay? And so Psalm, Proverbs 16, verse 33, if you were reading your proverb of the day, this would have been the last verse in Proverbs 16 today as you read it, okay? And it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from Yahweh. 
that God is the one who controls. And so you can have a, a, a thought process in your heart, and Psalm, Proverbs 16, verse 1 talks about this as well, right? That you can think about it, but every answer of the mouth is from the Lord. Do you really believe that God is sovereign? This is one of the things you really have to ask yourself. Is God sovereign? Can he oversee, can he control what you're doing? He knows your heart. Are you tracking? Do you really want his will to be revealed? Or do you want to excuse your actions by hoping maybe it comes up even? God, if it's evens, you want me to leave my wife. If it's odd, I'll stay. Do you have a throw a die on that one? Why not? Why, don't, why shouldn't I throw a dice on this? Because God may want me to leave. He's not going to want me to. You're speaking as a woman. Okay. But his word is clear. That's exactly right. There's no, I don't have to throw a die. The only reason I'm throwing a die on that one is to what? Hope that it comes out, I can leave and excuse myself. That clearly was God's will. I put it out there. God could have given me the odd and made me stay. But oh, no, he allowed me to go. It was even. Yep, yep. That's even. Okay, so I did it seven on eight times. Anyways, you know, and, you know, I waited until I had a majority, whatever. And, and we joke about that's when it plays out. But if God's will is revealed very clearly in his word, then there's no reason to what? Cast a, Cast a lot. This is only in a moment when it's not clear. Could Matthias be it? Yeah, a group of us really clearly think that he could be. Barsabbas? Well, there's nothing to disqualify him. Clearly, there's a group of us that believe that this really could be it. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, let's vote. Well, it still comes out. Let's vote. Well, it still comes out. Well, let's vote. It still comes out. So in the end, they decide to do what? Cast the lots. God, you who know the hearts, you know who you have chosen. Let it be revealed. And at that moment, Matthias is chosen. Now, don't you want to be in the room to know what Barsabbas is thinking at this moment? Yeah. <laughs> Cast it again. Cast it again. <laughs> I don't think he did. I think he was content. Because he wanted what? He wanted God's will. And there was still unity. When we get into Acts chapter 2, when we get into the end of the, the book, there's still ch- unity in the church. And now, all of a sudden, Matthias is one of those 12 apostles that everybody is sitting under the feet of. No one, we read nowhere in there, that there was now a dissension. And, and, and 50, 50 of the believers left the upper room that day to follow Barsabbas, who began his own ministry now because he wasn't chosen. That sounds like today, doesn't it? You know, he wasn't chosen to be the pastor. Somebody else was chosen, so he left, and he took half the flock with him. Because he only wanted his will, not God's will. So it was to determine a divine decision, but it was also to eliminate then a potential division. And you can look at these other passages. And so, you know, like, for example, like with the ones with the, the talking about the, the land that the, um, that the Israelites were going to get. I mean, think about it. That's a big deal. I mean, the, the, the casting of lots for the division, the, the, the plot of land you're going to get, some probably lots were considered better than other lots, right? And so, so now we have a new subdivision behind us. They're all there. Ten of us are going to live along this street, okay? And we're going we're gonna to roll the dice to decide who's going to live where. But don't you have a decision in your mind? You're thinking, boy, I'd really like to have that lot. That lot's a little bit bigger. I like the corner lot. Oh, can I have the one down there? It's got woods all around it. I'd rather have that one. But now all of a sudden, instead of you making this choice, you're doing what? You're casting the lots. Now on that one, with the, the land potential, I think maybe they did. Do you guys ever play billiards? Do you ever play pool? Okay, and do you ever like pull the, the thing out and, and, and you take it, get the ball out? And if it's, if it's a solid, then you're the solid. Do you guys ever play eight ball? Anyways. So I'm going to show my pool hall days. Anyways, and so you get a, the, the non-stripe ball out, you're the, you're the low ones. You get a stripe ball out, you're the high ones. Make sense? I mean, it's just you did it by lot. Make sense? You, so you, that's how you did it, okay? In an in NFL game, what do they do? They go into the, the, the center of the thing, and the guy does what? And they decide it by lot. Yeah, heads or tails. It's by lot. Now, if the world can live by that, 
and they don't believe in the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm not saying we need to have a sanctified paradise. <laughs> in, in our annual meetings, that'd be a lot faster, wouldn't they? The Urim and Thummim, that's exactly right. That's where it begins. I'm just saying that it was a toss of what? Faith. At that moment, that's what they looked for. Now, I want to go back and give one illustration regarding people voting. In New Guinea, years ago, there was a, a village that was reached for Christ. And there was a lot of, there was a great revival, um, revival, actually it wasn't, it was a revival, not a revival. Um, it was a great awakening, people got saved, but then all of a sudden they had a burden for the village across the mountain. They were cannibals. Mm. The person who goes would surely be eaten in their mind. And so they had their group of their deacons and their pastors who they believed would be used by God. And they prayed for a season of prayer, prayed and fasted. And then the day came where they're going to write down hidden vote on it. And when it came back, it came back unanimous. What does that mean? No. No, it couldn't be that. The vote came back unanimous. So even the guy who would be the sacrifice voted for himself. Something to think about. God can work through whatever the route is. But the goal is what? Unity. That's the focus. We accomplish it through prayer. Seeking God's will, seeking God's face. The rest is just a mechanism. Making sense? And if cast in the lots, which clearly here, God led them to cast lots, was the vehicle that would be used to preserve unity in the church, then so be it. There have been, honestly, times, straight up, I've cast lots on things. I didn't know what to do. But I did one thing that I pick on these guys for doing. I feel like they didn't have a third option. There should be a third option. Nothing. Neither one of them. So if it was me, and I'm using my dice, it had been one die. And it had been one in four is neither one. Two and five is Matthias. Three and six is Barsabbas. And then I rolled it. And then if it was a one or four, then God would have told me what? You're like, you didn't ask me right from the beginning whether I even wanted one right now. Because I've got this guy named Paul who, who I'm going to be using later on. So I'm not saying that it was wrong. There's a debate in my brain. I can't, it's one of those things where you can't wait to get to heaven and you find out, you know, was like Matthias, was he really supposed to be the 12th or was Paul really the 12th? It doesn't matter. He should have. He could have. He could have. That's what I think of myself. And that's where I come back on this. God could have made it work that, that it wasn't. So I'm, okay, I'm content with Matthias. But there's still that inside man that's still just kind of like, ah! The analyst side of me that says, wait a second, but I don't read the third option. But I believe God's sovereign. Does it make sense? And so in the end, there's a 12th, isn't there? And who is it? Matthias. Now the question is, you early church, how are you going to take this the rest of the time? Is he or isn't he? He is. So, what would be the principal feature of Family Bible Church? Is it unity? Do we really seek unity here? How focused on you are you then on keeping the unity? Or do, would you prefer what you want as opposed to what God wants for the assembly? How important is finding and following God's will for you? And then is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your, your goodness and kindness to us. Lord, even when there's times when we don't understand why things happen the way they happen, we know that you have a purpose. You have a plan. And so, Lord, I thank you for how you worked with the early church to bring your glory about. Help us, Lord, to, to seek to have unity here that we might reveal your oneness in the Godhead. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.